Hi. Like you said, my name is Matt Marquis. I am from Boston, Massachusetts. I am the chair of the Responsive Images Community Group, and I am extraordinarily tired, just for the record. The time here is completely wrong. But yeah, I work at Filament Group in Boston. Uh, we worked with Ethan Marcotte on bostonglobe.com, which is a little website for a local paper of ours. Uh, we are the leads on the jQuery mobile project, and we are crazy people. We obsess at Filament Group. We obsess over keeping requests low, we obsess over saving bandwidth, and ensuring universal access to the web for everybody. So, as you can likely guess, we took to responsive web design in a big way. Uh, we've never been fans of a highest common denominator approach. Um, multiple canvases made to suit the newest and trendiest frames. We've never believed in imposing rules and limitations on the web, which by very nature is designed to be device agnostic. So, per Ethan's original definition, responsive web design is made up of three things. Flexible grids, media queries, and flexible images and media. And since then, we developers have managed to expand on his original definition in fun and exciting ways. We have added one thing in particular to the equation, and that is that we have given responsive web design a reputation. Responsive web design has been taking the blame for mistakes that we have been making lately. PPK mentioned this. There was a time long ago when the web was just too hard. Uh, but we were young back then. We didn't know any better. And we eventually realized that it wasn't fair to put the burden on our users just because we couldn't cope. We realized that we, as an industry, just had to get better at this stuff. But at least back then, we had the decency to warn people when we were going to take the easy way out. Uh, I sometimes wonder if we shouldn't be putting up warnings now along the same lines. Just like the days before responsive web design, we've chosen a handful of familiar, comfortable contexts for the sites we're building. Not screen sizes and not specific devices. We've chosen to build sites that fit our day-to-day -day browsing context, the browsing environment we're used to. And what we're doing lately is building a web for us. Universal access is the fundamental underlying truth of the web. Building massive, resource-heavy websites means excluding millions of users around the world who only know the web by way of feature phones or slightly better. These are users that are paying for every kilobyte they consume on metered data plans. These are users that already have to keep tabs on which sites they need to avoid day to day to avoid incurring an additional cost. And not some nebulous bandwidth cost. Actual economic cost. Not for nothing, we have it pretty easy. I mean, we're developers, we have fast computers, we have stable internet connections, we have tons of bandwidth. I'm not sure I can breathe air that doesn't have Wi-Fi in it at this point. But that's our context. That's what we're used to. It's comfortable. We have the privilege of assuming that we'll have high bandwidth and stable networks. We can assume that sending out a request will almost always result in one coming back, barring the occasional subway tunnel. The people building the web have it the easiest on the web. And as a result, the average website is now well over a megabyte. That's gross. That's huge. And more than 60% of that, I think 64, give or take, is in images alone. Things aren't trending in a particularly good direction there either. In the past few months, the average size of the other assets hasn't really changed much, but the average image weight is rising very quickly. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see why that might be happening over the course of just a few short months. A retina image isn't just twice as big. It's twice as big in both dimensions. A true retina image can be up to four times larger. We can't just serve those up to everybody indiscriminately, when, especially when the vast majority of users won't see any perceptible benefit. At best, it's just wasteful. At worst, a mobile browser will rub mud in its hair and run screaming into the woods because it can't handle all this data that you're throwing at it, and it will just stop loading the page altogether. That's my dog, Zero. He's a good boy. Yes, he is. <sighs> so, let me answer this question 
by showing you guys my favorite website. Favorite website of all time. Better than the globe. In a, I really like the movie Biodome kind of way. This is moto.oakley.com. They sell goggles. This is a website about goggles. Over 55 megabytes of this images. Just for comparison, just to make a point, here are a few things data-wise that are smaller than this one page of images. This is a link to download the complete works of Shakespeare. All of them. He wrote a lot of stuff. If you were to download this file 10 times, you would almost have as much data as that one page cost just in images. An operating system that very literally changed the way the entire world uses computers. 50 megs installed. Still smaller than just the images. But we've done way cooler stuff, like as a species. A couple of operating systems and Shakespeare. I barely heard of that guy. The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Arguably our greatest achievement as a people. You can download 50 copies of what is arguably the greatest game ever made. And I say arguably because, I mean, there are a lot of other good games. So it's still 36 copies of Super Metroid, if you're so inclined. Shout out to the four people who know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But, you know, a little more relevant and modern. Thanks to the images on that Oakley site, that one landing page, just the one page, is bigger than the browser you use to view it. Bigger than all three of these. So yeah, yeah, you bet your ass I'm going to talk about images for an entire hour. This is a big deal. Now, I'll give you that the Oakley site is a pretty extreme example. But it seems to be the direction things are headed. I mean, the new Newsweek site, which has an absolutely incredible design, really, really sharp. It's also 2.2 megabytes. It's moving the average in the wrong direction. Now, looking at this, you can probably guess where most of the weight is coming from. Uh, it's 1.8 megs of images, which is a lot, but they're using huge images. It's kind of more excusable. Here's where we get ourselves into trouble, though. When we scale everything down to fit on a mobile device, uh, it's still 2.2 megabytes. We don't need that. That's a ton of wasted data. That's a bunch of images that we're not actually using for anything. The fact is that we're not really doing much of anything to tailor assets to a user's browsing context, and that's how responsive web design ends up with a reputation. We're tailoring our layouts just fine, but not our assets. And this isn't web design, er, responsive web design's fault. This is on us. So we're going to do better. Let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an image tag. Stay with me. You guys already know this one, I'm betting. To make an image flexible, we first remove the width and the height attributes. By setting a max width of 100% in our CSS, we're saying never allow this image to overflow its parent container. Scale up as far as you need to until you hit the inherent size of that image, but never actually overflow the container. As our flexible containers resize, so do the images, and that's pretty much it. So that's easy, but technically it's flexible images and media. So what about the media part of the equation? So like, what about our, our videos and our cool canvas infographics, and what about our mission-critical flash intros? I mean, it can get a little more complicated than this in terms of uh, retaining proportions and whatnot, but this is basically it. This isn't that bad. The real trouble with this approach is that it requires us to use assets that are at least as large as the largest size at which they'll ever be displayed. That was just barely English. I'm very tired. But if this image is going to be displayed anywhere from 2,000 pixels wide to 300-ish pixels wide, it means serving up a 2,000 pixel wide image. That's a lot of wasted bandwidth. Now, HTML5's video specification makes this surprisingly painless. You can put a media query right in an attribute on a source element. So in this example, the smaller video is served to any device with a screen smaller than 600 pixels, a window smaller than 600 pixels. This works, 
like right now. Like I can't stress this enough. Like nobody knows about it. It's actually at risk for removal from the specification because so few people can use it because nobody knows about it. Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Safari, IE10, uh, iOS, Android, which doesn't support anything, supports this. Even Windows Phone. Uh, do this. Start using this. So while we were working on the globe, we tried to think of a similar means of serving context-appropriate images, uh, de delivering larger images to devices with larger screens, while erring on the side of caution, starting with a mobile image, treating that as the basic experience, so to speak, and enhancing it up from there if it's qualified. That way, if anything should go wrong with our JavaScript, if we should run into any issues on the server or whatever, we're defaulting to the safer option. The user still gets a perfectly usable experience. They still get a representative image. It's just a little smaller. The key to this approach was getting the screen's width in JavaScript in time to relay that information to the server and defer that request for the original SRC. I mean, an image tag does one thing, and it does it well. It finds the source you specify in the SRC, and it puts it on the screen. And there's not a lot of room for interrupting that. So we put together a clever little hack, I don't mind saying, that relied on cookies and a spacer diff. I'm not ashamed. You know, you do what you need to do. And uh, it, I mean, it worked. No lie, it worked really well for a while, and then it broke. Um, <clears throat> thanks to increasingly aggressive prefetching in several of the major browsers now, uh, the image's SRC is requested before we have a chance to apply any custom logic. So before we could even set that cookie, the prefetcher was going out, finding the SRC, requesting it, then rendering the page. Um, but we tried a bunch of stuff. And we got desperate. And what followed is the web developer equivalent of scary campfire stories. It was a sordid tale of no script tags, and dynamically injected base tags, document write, eval. It was not pretty. But more importantly, none of it really worked. So at Filament Group, uh, we, we kept dragging anyone we could find into these conversations. Uh, Ethan Marcotte, Scott Jell was there, who did most of the thinking for me. Uh, Paul Irish, Jason Grigsby. It was, we're talking like the Avengers, but with semicolons. We found, we got anyone who would listen who has made a website, and we dragged them in and was like, help us figure this out. But still, nothing. And I mean, pretty obvious by this point that it wasn't just an issue we could throw a little JavaScript at and be done with it. So we started thinking, if HTML5 offered us like a native solution to this, just totally, let's just wing it. Let's try and come up with some JavaScript-y ideas based on what a native solution might look like. What would that look like? Well, like what, what kind of form would that take? What, how would that even begin to work? And this thing is pages and pages long. And uh, we went through every possible permutation of image tags and attributes that already existed. And this is still up. If you want to take a look, please don't delete it, I guess. Bruce Lawson originally proposed a markup pattern for delivering context-appropriate images that more or less fell in line with the existing rich media elements in HTML5, uh, like the video tag. We like this. This made sense. I mean, this is a pattern that already exists in HTML, and this is exactly the behavior we're looking for. This is where we started. We knew the video tag could do it, so why can't we do that with images? So we nerds formed the Responsive Images Community Group at the W3C so we could hash this thing out and, and like rough out a spec. And we're all just winging it. We don't know how to write a spec, but we know we want one. So around this time, uh, we presented this idea to the What Working Group. And in response, uh, they pitched their idea for a markup-based means of serving context-appropriate images. And when I say pitched, I mean they added it to their draft specification within four days. Not that I'm bitter. Uh, you might be wondering what that markup looks like. Well, I submit this without comment. In the name of diplomacy, I simply presented to you, the viewer. But I will say this, it was n poorly received by the members of the Responsive Images Community Group. 
So I'll spare you the gory details, but I did what any outraged internet person does, is I went and I blogged about it. Uh, we butted heads with the What Working group for quite some time. Uh, it wasn't what I would strictly say. I wouldn't call it productive, necessarily. Uh, and I don't mind saying that I'm to blame for some of that ongoing tension. I am from Boston. We're not a diplomatic people. But we're right. <clears throat> the thing is, for all that, for all that mess, some signal did come through all the noise. Uh, the What Working Group's proposal did, although the rest of it was inscrutable, it did handle one thing in a pretty efficient way, uh, resolution switching. And it did it outside of media queries, which the more we thought about it, the more we kind of liked. Splitting things up sort of makes sense. I mean, we have two separate concerns in play. We could still rely on media attributes to select the appropriate source element. It makes sense. We decide these breakpoints based on a combination of things. Our layout media queries, um, just comparing image sizes to see what fit best for what screen, the weight of the image, alternate cropping and zooming. So you can zoom in on the important part of an image on a smaller screen rather than lose all that detail with a giant image that's more appropriate for desktop. Media queries are an absolute on paper. you know. Uh, whatever we specify in a media query should happen, full stop. After we've established a source element, we then present the resolution options with disparate sources. Um, this is where we use a portion of the What Working Group's proposed SRC set attribute for determining which resolution source is most appropriate. Unlike media queries, SRC set is spec as a suggestion. If I'm on a Retina MacBook, but I'm tethered to a shaky 3G connection, I probably don't want high resolution images. I'd probably rather opt out of those. By acting as a suggestion, SRC set could allow browsers to introduce user settings, like always give me high res images, always give me low res images, or give me high res images as bandwidth permits. The browser has that bandwidth information at hand. We can't necessarily get that. I mean, we've tried, there was the the navigator object where we could pull bandwidth, but it's tough to get like an accurate reading because they leave the page, they only spend so much time on the site. We can't really get an overall view of the bandwidth that they're using, but the browser can. It can get the, the bandwidth used over the entire browsing session. So where the browser has that bandwidth information at hand, that's probably where that decision should be made. Not for the user the way we've been doing, but with the user. And now you're looking at this markup and you're thinking that it's still a little on the scary side, but I'm pushing it here for the sake of an example. If you didn't need the resolution switching, but you did just want to specify one different source based on the layout, that's cool. You can just use picture. If you only need resolution switching and it's like a little user icon in a comment or something, you can use that too, independent of picture. Not only can the two proposals harmoniously coexist, but they complement each other in a big way. We've proposed this version of the picture element to the HTML working group, and a few months ago, now we reached a first public working draft, which means it's like a grown-up spec. It's like the real thing now. Um, it's time for implementers to start digging in and asking us questions and helping us hash out issues and actually getting this into some browsers. Uh, we have a sample Chromium implementation which is awesome, thanks to Yoav, where is he? That man right there, buy him a beer later. There are still a couple of tricky issues left to be solved, which again, I defer to smarter people than I, um, but we're making progress. Keep an eye on responsiveimages.org to stay on top of this stuff, uh, and join up with the Responsive Images community group. I mean, this is a standards effort led entirely by the developer community, which is largely unprecedented. We're well over 200 members now. Uh, I, I sincerely hope you'll all join. I've always kind of wanted to do this. Um, could we show of hands who is in the Responsive Images community group? Yeah, awesome. Good. I've never actually tried that, gentlemen, ladies. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, web standards. Awesome. This doesn't do us a hell of a lot of good right now, though. Uh, so this, I mean, this could still be a while yet, and we have actual work to do, like, at our jobs. 
So, fortunately for us, we can start using this markup today. Scott Gell, who I hate tremendously, for the record. Uh, this is an aside, this is a total aside. Scott came up with a polyfill for the picture element uh, while we were writing the spec, which was awesome. He helped us hash out a lot of the issues we were gonna run into in, in the spec by just writing the JavaScript equivalent. He did this without exaggeration on a wooden raft floating down the Mekong River tethered to his phone. Like I woke up one morning and I had an email and it was like, yeah, I built that thing you've been talking about for like nine months uh, on a boat. No big deal. Scott Jail, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so what Picture Fill does is it emulates the pattern that we've been talking about, the native picture pattern. There's a polyfill branch where if you drop a picture in along with the script, it, it polyfills it like anything else would. Uh, there's also a div-based branch which uses all current standards compliant markup and data attributes to kind of mimic the same deal. If you're really brave, you could use the picture markup wholesale. Um, I wouldn't recommend that though. Is everybody seeing the wink? I'm winking. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm mostly joking. Uh, when you're looking into a responsive image solution, it's important to keep in mind that things are likely to change. Neither the picture element nor SRC set are implemented in any browser as far as we know. We don't know for certain that they won't change once we get a real implementation. This doesn't mean the picture fill is just a stopgap. I mean, this is something, the div-based one, is something we're using in client work right now. It has huge, huge benefits. Really nothing in the way of downsides apart from two years ago when some native solution exists, some nerd's gonna look at the source code and be like, why the hell would they use divs for that? So yeah, again, we're using it in our client work, like globalnews.ca, uh, the new rent.com, which I'm not sure has launched. Maybe keep that a secret. <clears throat> Microsoft is using it on their new responsive homepage. Dribble.com is using it site-wide. Uh, last I heard, Picture Fill is also in the Drupal 8 core, uh, using the markup wholesale, which is a little scary, but okay, awesome. But again, this isn't just like a stopgap thing. This has tremendous genuine like benefits. This is the 1.2 megabyte Microsoft.com homepage. Still pretty big. I mean, it's above average. But when you put this on a phone, because it's serving those smaller, more phone-appropriate images, it's 800K, which is way more reasonable on a 3G connection. So this is the non-polyfill syntax, which is even scarier looking, admittedly, but... It's more or less the same as the picture element itself. Uh, it's just using HTML5's data attributes and a no script tag for the fallback, ensuring that, again, the least hazardous image is served up by default. If JavaScript should blow up in your face because of an ad tag or whatever, you still get a reasonable image. It's still representative. It's just not gigantic, which is nice. So we have new standards in the works. We have a solid plan for our bitmap images. That's cool. Bitmap images aren't really the whole responsive images story, though. Uh, do you guys know what's awesome? SVG is awesome. I love SVG. It's right there in the name, scalable vector graphics. You don't run into many honest-to-God cases of one-size-fits-all on the web. But SVG does exactly that, smoothly scaling to whatever size you could possibly need. People haven't always felt this way. Uh, some people, a friend, was a little scared of it at one point. Because man, what is a vector even? What, uh, they're made of math. I don't, I don't like that, I like pixels. I mean, they, they like pixels. Little squares, it's easy. We get pixels, you know? That's kind of what we work with. <sighs> this may shock you, but that idiot was me. I was that man. I knew the benefits of SVG. I knew that it stood to have tremendous benefits to our users. But I was hesitant to work with it. Like, it's scary. It's a new thing. It happens. And let me tell you what changed that opinion from a development standpoint very, very quickly. 
Have you ever opened up like a GIF or a ping in your editor of choice by accident? And it's like the Matrix, which came out like 15 years ago. It's gibberish. It doesn't make any sense at all. I did that with an SVG one day. And uh, I went to YouTube immediately. And I queued up the song A Whole New World from Aladdin. And I shed a single tear in slow motion. And doves flew up behind me. It was very dramatic. This is markup. I mean, this is weird SVG markup, but that's cool. This is weird markup. I like weird markup. This is like e-newsletter markup. It's a lot of inline, sort of clunky stuff, but a lot of new stuff also, like RGBA. This is awesome. If I'm going to make a quick edit to an icon or something, if I have to change the opacity, if I have to change the color, something like that, I don't have to wait half an hour for Illustrator to open. I'll just open it and change it. It's awesome. It is, however, kind of a pain when we need to go through and save out two versions of every image, because fallbacks, because browsers. SVG isn't supported everywhere, most notably on older versions of Android. No surprise to anybody. The majority of Android users are still on Android 2.3, which I think is 30, 35 years old. Um, so for every single SVG we used, for every icon, we need to provide a fallback ping. A few months ago, a filament group started hashing out an idea for a new tool that we could use to automatically generate all those fallback pings, which is cool. That's handy. It wasn't too tricky in and of itself. Um, but there was another factor. There was something we needed to destroy forever, something that we hated with the fire of a thousand suns. Sprite sheets. I hate sprite sheets. As I hate hell, all Montagues, and you can read the rest if you download the Shakespeare thing from earlier. I hate making them. I hate working with them. They feel like a relic. It's something we've been doing forever. It's something that feels like one of those things that we still do just because that's the way we do things. And I hate that, and we can do better. You can't question the effectiveness, though. I mean, like I said, we're obsessed with requests and keeping data low. It's still one request for every icon on your site, and that's cool, and it gets cached, and that's even better. But there's got to be a better way of doing this. And I mean, data URIs. Data URIs are great. And we could put all of our icons in one style sheet. The style sheet would basically act as our sprite sheet, but without needing to hack around background positions and without needing to pad out stuff so that it doesn't show the next icon within the same element, or we have to use markup for our icons, which I hate so much. This is a thing with me. If we change something, we don't need to rework the sprite. We don't need to change a bunch of background positions. This is cool. This is way easier to work with. But this is still kind of a headache because we have to go through and save out the image, then convert it to a data URI, then save out the fallback, then convert that to a data URI if we want to use the same treatment there. It still kind of sucks. SVGs are awesome. Data URIs are awesome. Working with them kind of sucks. And now, like, infomercial style. If only there were a better way. And then it cuts to black and white, and I spill my coffee on myself. We had recently introduced Grunt to our dev process anyway uh, from the command line. Grunt is a task runner. So you can set it up to do any manner of things to your project, to a repo. You can have it uh, concatenate all your files, all your JavaScript and your CSS into one distribution file. It'll minify your JavaScript and CSS. It'll lint your code. It will run your unit tests invisibly in the background. Grunt is awesome. You know when you like first started using GitHub, and you were like two projects in, and it wasn't quite so terrifying anymore, and you were like, I've been living my life all wrong. Like, how did I get anything done prior to Git? Grunt. Everybody go to this website. They have nice stickers. It's awesome. It's also a word I never thought I would be saying on stage. Grunt. But here we are. So we whipped a little something up to automate that data URI and SVG fallback saving process. 
Grunticon is a plugin for Grunt. You point it at a directory of SVG assets, individual icons, and when you run Grunticon, it does a couple of things. Very tired. First, it generates a directory of ping fallbacks for you. Cool, it's handy. It then outputs three style sheets. The first is a data URI set of all the SVGs, which is cool. So that's our like sprite sheet, but without the huge pain in the ass of using a sprite, sorry, of using a sprite sheet. That's for the grown-up browsers. Awesome. For the Android 2.3s of the world, it also generates a data URI fallback style sheet with data URI pings. Cool. That covers pretty much everybody except IE 6 and 7. And if for some twisted reason you have to support those, uh, it still generates a third style sheet that just links out to the fallback PNGs as usual. So that's all three. And it comes with a loader script that does a feature test to determine whether it supports SVG, the browser in question, and serves up the most appropriate one. If JavaScript isn't available for that test, it just links out to the pings as usual. So the SVG icons are kind of an enhancement. You're always going to have icons, no matter what. But you might get better ones, depending. By default, it uses the names of the files to generate the icon classes. So you don't have to think about how the whole fallback pattern works out selector-wise every single time you're putting an icon on the page. You just use the Grunticon loader. It chooses the appropriate style sheet, and it looks for these classes, and then it puts the icon on there it does all of the magic for you. And I use the term magic very intentionally. Um, we originally called it Unicon, but uh, lawyers, something, something lawsuit, they got mad. But it still has the sweetest readme file you have ever seen in your life. Yeah, yeah. So we have just barely scratched the surface of all of our many, many options for serving images in a way that fits our users' context. But I hope you guys feel like you've kind of got a sense of some of the tools that you can use now. Um, the responsive web design is still pretty new, I mean, in an internet sense. We're all still just kind of getting the hang of it. And we're all a little clumsy about serving up assets. If anything, I hope that your one takeaway from this talk is not use X or Y or keep an eye on Z. It's not to use any one tool or method, but to keep thinking. Like there's always, always some room to optimize on a project. And there's tiny steps we can take, like on that Microsoft homepage. Just serving up a different, smaller image in that one place saves, you know, half a megabyte from user on a mobile context. This is people on metered data plans, this is people who are actually paying to use these websites. We can shift that burden from them without putting a ton of extra burden on us as developers. There are easy ways that we can make these changes and have tremendous benefit to the users. Speaking of responsive images, I have an agenda up here. Uh, a couple of our ICG members have put together a quick survey about responsive image use cases that we need to prove to some people that they're legitimate. Do me a favor. Uh, you guys go to there and check a couple of boxes, and that would be good. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm bringing my coffee, though. Nice shirt. Thanks. Thanks. I don't actually care for yours very much. Yeah, all right. I don't care for your face. How about that? I'm going to step outside. All right, we're going to do a Q&A thing, and then it's going to be followed by like a battle royale kind of things, and bottles will get broken, and it'll be fun. I left that'll a bunch of time, too, on yeah, no, that's purpose for the, for the Q&A. Oh, and for the fight. Oh, uh, that, too. Yeah. Anyway, so serious stuff now. Um, Great presentation. Uh, there is there is a few questions about some of the other solutions that are out there, right? Because um, you know, obviously, this is something that other people have been working on and trying to find different alternative like ways to make this work now. Mm. Um, one of the ones that is fairly popular out there is the adaptive images um, thing from Matt Wilcox, oh, yeah. the PHP based thing. Yep. Um, they want. How do you like? How do you feel that fits into the equation? It's good. I mean, the the major difference between that and kind of the approach we took on the globe is that it does a bunch of the resizing on the server, 
which is totally feasible um, because you may not need to go in and like handcraft every smaller image. You might just say, I want a kind of smaller image for mobile without different cropping and zooming. Um, totally something you can automate with picture fill or the picture element. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm you can actually it. bring it in. Get, but isn't there like there's a first page load issue on that though, right? I think. I think it's still using either the cookie approach or something cookie-esque. So it's the same issue we had with the globe where it fell apart because of the prefetcher. And on larger screens, you're going to get that first smaller image loaded in and then replaced by the larger image, which you can kind of assume more bandwidth in a desktop environment, but don't take that as me encouraging you to ever do that. Um, sticking with the uh, other solutions that people had questions about, um, uh, so fonts. Like people are using icon fonts in a yes. lot of situations to kind of combat some of the things you were talking about with like sprites and stuff like that. And, um, what do you think about the icon font solution? I don't hate them. <laughs> I mean, they're okay. I've never, I, in yeah. fairness, I haven't really used them extensively on a project. Um, feels hacky to me still. Like every once in a while, you hear about how somebody fixed icon fonts with some new thing, and it's like every couple of weeks. And that, to me, I'm like, eh, maybe I'll give it some time. I mean, it's cool. There's a bunch of limitations on, like, yeah, it's not a one I, color and all that. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. And it's, 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 a, it's a cool solution, um, which I think in some cases, I think it's like with a lot of these things, it's like you have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis yeah, and determine sure. what you're going to do there. The screen reader um, aspect kind of weirds me out a little bit, too. Yeah, there's ways around that, though, correct? Like yes. if you kind of map there are it actually, there are, there are some icon fonts that are ligatures, which I don't think are tremendously well supported, but it'll actually use the entire word. And when you type like T-W-I-T-T-E, and then when you type the R, it ligatures all the word letters together into the icon, which is really cool. Like if you used it in a really clever way, you could be like, if you had a little, like a silhouette of a person's head and then account, if that were the word user, user account. So from a screen reader, that still works, you know? Which is cool, but I don't know. It feels case by case. And sticking, like SVGs. Yeah, and sticking with the trade-off thing, the one thing too with like the JavaScript-based solutions, like PictureFill, which I use too in a lot of production sites because it gave them a dollar for pretty exciting. Thanks, yeah. Um, but you know, it does the the prefetching, the aggressive prefetching and stuff that you were discussing. That's actually a feature. That's typically we would want that because we want the preloader, we want the images to get there as quickly as possible. Yes. And you do lose some of that when you go with a solution like that. Yeah. That's so why I keep picking standards fights. Amen to that. Yeah, because once we yeah. have a native thing, we can take advantage of the preloading, and we can serve the appropriate image, in theory. You know. And hats off to you, because I know that, that that whole situation got a little emotional, a little heated. There were people, potentially in the room, who may have been a little less diplomatic than I think even your Boston self was at the time. Um, but like, where, is, where are we sitting with that? So you said that they were kind of at the, how are we looking at like for browser implementation though of this? We keep picking fights. Uh, nothing officially in the works just yet. I mean, we have some, some stuff that we haven't landed in any of the browsers, uh, but we're working on it. I mean, we just hit, in standards terms, we just now hit first public working draft as of a couple of months ago. Things go kind of slow standards wise, as it turns out. But we're getting there. Yeah, something. What are the? What are, is there like any particular hangups and stuff that are getting in the way in terms of that, or is it just the it's slowness of the process and figuring out how to make it work with the preloader is yeah. a big issue. Um, a lot of people say they don't like me personally. They don't like my stupid face, and they refuse to work with us. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I totally don't get that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank no, you. I'm just. I'm on your side on that. <laughs> um, so, oh. Uh, SVG, you started talking about SVG stuff. Have you yes. seen the clown car thing? Dope. Yeah, it's pretty clever, huh? It's awesome. Um, it scares me. I don't know that I would use it in a production site because I can't even imagine wiring that thing. As can you, you get, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, can the you clown explain car the clown car? Yeah. It's, um, you take an SVG file, and like you guys saw, it's, it's markup in there, and you can apply logic, and you can use CSS, more or less, in an SVG. So what this does is a single SVG file that contains different image sources in the SVG CSS, and it contains media queries. So as you shrink that SVG itself down, it'll replace the background image on the SVG and change it to different images. It's awesome. It's wicked cool, sorry. 
but I don't know how I would wire that up to like a CMS. I don't, I, it still feels hacky. There's nothing in the way of a fallback, um, like for Android, unless you served up a separate image altogether and then you're kind of in the same boat we're in anyway. It is really, really cool though. Uh, it's, yeah, it's still way, is that it? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly on the pronunciation of the last name, but yeah, Estelle. Yeah, Estelle Way, and she calls it the clown car technique because you pack a bunch of images into an image. It's really cool, worth checking out. The CMS thing, though, I mean, that's not, obviously that's not like isolated to that. That's actually a big piece of this whole puzzle. Right. Um, because you're talking about, um, well, let's say, we're going to stick with the, the use cases that you were giving, like the performance-based things, just strictly size perspective. Okay. Um, you still have to have something on the back end that's doing the resizing and spitting all of that out. That's fairly simple. But if you start right. going into art direction, which you didn't really touch on much there, I don't think, during the yeah, presentation, I made a mention. then that's... that gets really complicated. Right, which can still be automated to some extent. The, the art direction use case is um, being able to, like you saw, there was that big picture of Obama looking pensive and a bunch of stuff in the background. If you just shrink that down to a mobile size, you're going to lose a ton of detail. The art direction use case is like you could choose a part of that image and the different source could just be zoomed in on there. So at a smaller size, it makes a lot more sense. Um, you could automate it. Uh, I've seen, what's the name of that script? for responsive images where it like uses CSS to zoom in within a viewport. Yeah, do you know? Focal point, focal point. Oh, yeah. From Adam Bradley, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it uses a large image and then it uses CSS to kind of create a viewport out of a div that the image is in and zoom in on parts of the image. And it's like an automated thing. You can select an area. You could do that on the server side as well. So you could have like you upload a giant image and then there's a drop down or whatever that says zoom in on bottom right. So you could semi-automate it, but you probably wouldn't want to rely on that completely because you probably want to do something custom here and there. And I know you didn't get into it much, but that is another really valid use case, right? I mean, we're, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, which I think Yo has actually done a little bit of digging on that recently with Tung. Yeah, the man has data. Yeah, so actually, Yoav is another person to pick the brain with for sure. At, yeah, absolutely. After that, to him, he's so. way smarter than me. I just make the most noise about it. You are quite loud. I am quite loud. <laughs> what do you think of the compressive images solution that people are using for some of the Retina stuff? You guys use some of that, right? Yeah, we wrote up a, a blog post about it. Compressive images is oh, that's weird. It like doesn't make any sense on the surface level. You take a JPEG, and say you needed it to be fifteen hundred pixels wide at the largest. You save it out at like 6,000 pixels wide, but you turn the JPEG compression all the way down to like zero. So when you look at it, it looks like absolute garbage. But when you compress it down, somehow the way the browsers rescale it, it actually looks just as sharp, if not sharper. It's really weird. It works really well. But for content images, if you were to grab that image and drag it out to your desktop to use it for something later, you get a humongous gross image. Uh, it, also eats up a ton of memory on like underpowered devices. Mobile. I was actually going to ask if you'd done any <clears> testing Android. on that. It's tough to get figures. Yeah. Because you can't really record like this has demolished X memory from this crummy HTC. Nothing against HTC. They're here. Um, it's cool. It's again, it's kind of in hack territory. It's kind of in the weird stuff. But that's awesome. Like I like that people are still hashing out bizarre stuff for this. Yeah, well, I mean, until we get something in place, I mean, at this point, almost everything is still kind of hackish to right. some extent. A little less hacky for certain things. Right, but like I said, plan for whatever you're using to be replaced eventually. Right. Uh, so, um, retina images, you didn't, I don't know that you got into a whole bunch of that stuff, but you would also, with like picture fill, there's actually a version of picture fill that handles the retina opt-in, right? Yeah, Does you, there's, still a, exist? there's a branch that uses SRC set, I believe. And then there's one where that user setting that I kind of talked about a little bit, um, we have that built into one version of picture fill where it'll give you the image. And then on any image that's being picture filled, I guess, um, it gives you a little icon that says like SDHD. By default, it serves up the standard definition images. You can click on that and opt into HD. It uses local storage to like retain that preference, so to speak. And then every other page you hit on the site, it'll load up the high definition image by default. Cool. Well, I think Martin's ready. So I think we're going to. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think I saw somebody tweet out the poll to do the shirt voting. So please, you know, vote for me. Um, yeah, the voting on the shirt. Don't do it.